Hey, good day, fellas. Welcome to Uncensored Advice for Men. This show is for you. I'm proud of you, fellas. Thank you for um, taking your own personal journey and your growth into your own hands, into your own ears through this show. Um, as always, reach out to us at uncensoredadviceformen.com if you have questions or maybe you have some advice to share with the men in our community. So with that, uh, Brandon reached out to uh, our group and he wants to talk to us today about public speaking and communication. So uh, Brandon, welcome to the show. Josh, the pleasure is absolutely mine. Thanks for having me. Yeah, let's start with this. Where are you recording from today? I'm based in Montreal in Canada. What about yourself? Uh, Canadian. I'm, a, uh, I'm in Florida, so a little bit across the globe from you. Uh, my mom was born in Canada, in uh, Ontario. I believe I, I'm not very familiar, but uh, what's the weather like? If you looked out the the window right now, what is it, what's it look like outside? It's it's pretty cold. That's why I actually go to Florida every quarter or so. So I'm I'm in Fort Lauderdale a lot, Orlando, West Palm Beach, yeah. and just just to escape the winter, frankly. So so yeah, it's cold, but I definitely love Montreal. I'm born and raised there, and I, I don't think I'll ever leave. But maybe I'll change my mind later in life. Yeah. Well, next time you're in Florida, give give us a shout. We're in Central Florida, just a little north of Orlando. Um, Brendan, who are you? Who am I? I would say for me. Josh, that's a question I've I've struggled a lot in general. Like, who are we as human beings? How do we define ourselves? Like, some people start with their role. Oh, this is what I do at my company. This is my title. This is this is how I show up in the world. Other people look at it more from impact, right? They look at that question and they go, "This is how I serve other people. This is how I create value in the world." I would say the way I answer that question is who I am is is someone who expands possibility and opportunity for other people. That's who I am, right? So I grew up in in not the best circumstances. I had an alcoholic father, dysfunctional family, grew up in Montreal, but I was given the golden ticket of life, which was I was born in a first world country and I was the first ever person in our generation of families to be given that opportunity. And I took it seriously, selfishly in my tens to, to gain more wealth and to focus on money like every other human being. <laughs> That, that doesn't have a lot. But then after that, I expanded that possibility to see how can I help other people. So I would say who I am is, is a person who got a lucky chance in life and who gets to now use his unique gift to, to share with the world, which happens to be communication in my case. Yeah. You chasing, so alcoholic father, golden ticket, first in your generation to kind of be born in this area. So pressures on, right? And also uh, stresses on, pressures and stresses are on. And you said you chased wealth kind of early on how old are you as of this time of recording 26 currently 26 okay so in your tens you could say you know so uh you chased wealth what did that look like and why were you chasing it for sure so fa fantastic question josh so when i was 12 years old i matured really quickly as, as a human being and the reason wasn't because i was smarter than the other 12 year olds in my class i had to mature out of necessity so both of my parents were factory workers so for me the focus was how do i win in life so when i was 12 and i was sitting in that classroom a career counselor looked at all of us and said what do you want to do with your life and obviously most 12 year olds they go i want to be an astronaut i want to be a stand-up comedian i want to do something special with my life you know what I answered, Josh? I said accountant. And the reason I didn't change my mind either for seven years was because I focused on figuring out what Gay Hendricks calls, now I can articulate it better, obviously I couldn't when I was 12, yeah. my zone of excellence. What's something I'm really good at that I think other people will pay me for it and I don't necessarily need to be happy doing it, which is a very different frame than other people have. Why? Because money was always tight in our family. I remember growing up, $100 seemed like a fortune. Even today, you know, the, the other day I was buying Chinese food for us. Obviously, 100 bucks is not that big of a deal these days. But even my mom was like, oh, my God, $100 is so much. So I grew up with a lot of family debt. We had a lot of challenges. My dad lost his job because of the alcohol, too probably when I was around 15, 16 years old. So there was a lot of pressure on me to figure it out because my, my mom became the only earner financially on a minimum wage salary with me and my little sister. So I felt a lot of pressure growing up that I largely put on myself, not really from my mom, to say, I need to make it in life quickly and I need to generate income so I can support my family and pay off all of the debt because she had so much pressure and stress in her life. So a lot of that, that's where it came from. Yeah. Um 
two questions about, you know, talking about fathers, right? So I talk a lot about my dad on this, and I find that with men, their relationship with their father really dictates and, and helps form the kind of man they become uh, in their future, right? Um, so one, talking about your dad, how does, how does dad feel about, you know, you, you sharing alcoholism and, and, you know, losing jobs because of it, you know, the, the pressures your mom had to take on. So how does your family feel about you talking about it? And how do you feel about talking about dad today? For sure. So a couple of thoughts on that one, Josh. The first one is he passed away a few years ago. Yeah. So he, he probably doesn't know I'm talking about it that much. <laughs> I'm so sorry, man. I, I nervously <laughs> laugh, uh, but that's, it's terrible losing, losing a father. I, I'm, so I'm, I'm sorry for your loss, dude. It, to, totally good, Josh. And, yeah. and the other piece is my mom and my sister know that I speak about it. But if I'm being perfectly transparent, we never really had a conversation around that. Yeah. Like, uh, like we, I never, and that's actually good feedback for me. I should have those conversations more often. I think it's just because of our background and who we are culturally that, that, but I always talk about him in a positive light. I think, and, and I mean that in two different angles. So one side is sure he had his challenges in his life. And I think it makes me feel more, it makes me more human, right. To the person who's listening to this, because nobody's perfect. Nobody gets the perfect set of hands. But the the other piece is the the guy was really resilient, right? There's a lot of things I learned from my dad that I also talk about. Like he was such a gift because if he's the one, and that that was a tough kind of healing moment for me in the last few years, was he was actually the reason I became successful. Because if he never came to Canada, I never would have gotten that opportunity. It took like eight flights to come here. So I think that that balanced approach to 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 me discussing doesn't bother my sister, my mother too much, but. But you're right. I should have those conversations with them. I guess I'm too young to <laughs> just ask <asking. laughs> to realize. You know, I'm sure my kids are going to write a book about me one day, and I'm sure that they're going to have. You know, Dad was an entrepreneur, and he risked it all. And you know, my daughter's by the time she was nine, she's lived in nine different homes. So I'm sure that, you know, with every generation, our goal is to be a better dad than my dad was. My dad was a good dad, but his dad was terrible. So it's like as we get, we're supposed to get better. So it's just a question that I that I find a similar pattern with successful men or men who are high driving, there's, there's usually some type of dad situation there. Um, so you grew up and, you know, age 12, I asked, you know, Brandon, Brandon, what do you want to do? I want to be a CPA, right? <laughs> like, what, did, did you wind up going down that path of uh, becoming a CPA? Uh, I did. And, and just to build on your point, I, I'm definitely in that category too. I would say most of my success in my tens, quote unquote, was driven by insecurity and proving my dad wrong, right? So it was really focused on anger because I wanted to show him that I could be successful, that I could be the odd one out. That's why I haven't been drunk once in my life. So there's kind of like two different perspectives you could take when you have that type of upbringing. Unfortunately, most people take the first perspective, which is they become that individual or some version of that individual in a bad way, not in a good way. But then there's the other piece, which is how do I do the complete opposite of what that individual did so I could be the model student, the model person. So for me, the story that I took, and I'm sure you talk a lot about this on this podcast, you get to choose the interpretation. You can't choose what happens to us in life a lot of the times, but we get to choose the interpretation. There's a great story on this. And the story really quick, Josh, is about two sons and a father. So father has two sons. The, the father is an alcoholic. He's a drug addict. He makes a lot of mistakes in his life. And I got lucky with my dad in, my, in many ways where he didn't have any of those other problems. It was mostly alcohol that it was his Achilles heel. And he had these two sons. And one of them became really, really horrible in life. He, he made all the same mistakes. He had a terrible life. And the other son had a really successful life. He became a community leader, got married, had kids, you know, did all the right things. And they interviewed both of the sons, Josh, and they asked them the same question, what made you successful in life? But what was fascinating, Josh, is they both had the same answer. And the answer was, with a father like mine, what else could you expect? And it didn't make sense to the interviewer. So the first person who had a terrible life looked at the interviewer and said, you know, my dad was an alcoholic, he was a drug addict, and it was all because of him that I made all of these mistakes, and now I'm a horrible human being, and it's all because of him. And the second person said, my dad taught me a lot. He taught me what not to do in my life. 
So because of him, I became the best role model I could be for my community. I got to be the best human being that I could be. And I showed up that way, all thanks to him. And I was guilty as charged there as well. Hmm. So proving dad wrong, was it a, an active thing where he was like, Brendan, you're not going to amount for anything. You're going to be a drunk. You're going to work in a factory. Like, was, were these things that he expressed to you or was it kind of a nonverbal thing? Yeah, it was a mix. It was a mix. So a lot of it was definitely verbal, where it was like, you're not going to do anything. And there was actually one moment in my life that actually changed my life in a massive way, which is when I was 15. So what a lot of people don't know, Josh, is me and my dad lived together for eight, nine years until his passing, but I never talked to him since I was 15. So there's one moment in my life when I was 15, he was the only negative person left in my life. And I was writing a psychology paper or something, and he just kept opening the door every five minutes just to bother me and he was he you know he had a little bit too much and at some point i just got so fed up that i just deleted him from my life and i just stopped responding as if he never existed anymore yeah. and that wasn't really a, a healthy response but i think for the brendan who was 15 years old it made a lot of sense for him in his life because he needed to cut him out to be successful so every day when i came home after that i just never talked to him again and then my, my mom would always got upset. My dad would start yelling. He was like, why aren't you talking to me for like the first few months? And then they just let it go. And that just became the new normal in our family. Wow. Yeah. So what, did that happen to the day he died? I, I talked to him the, um, probably a day before he died. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. What did that conversation look like? If you don't mind me asking. No, you can totally ask. It was really short. It was like yeah. 30, 45 seconds. I just, uh, I just knew he was, he was going to go at this point because uh, his, his liver got really got really serious yeah. so at this point it was it was finished so i just went up to him and i smiled and i just how are you doing and he just smiled back and he just said i'm doing well and then i said it's great and that's it that was the conversation and i left and then five days later he died wow yeah looking back do you have any regrets in in the conversations or not talking or did you do what was best for you and the family like where does your brain go not i don't want to you know Un, unpeel things, you know, just for the sake of doing it. But what I, what I want is for us guys to, to learn from the, 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 how other men respond to things. And I'd love to learn from you. For absolutely, Josh, I, I totally get the intention. You're, you're hundred percent fine. So, so he, here, here's the way I would think about it, Josh, because, because some parts of me haven't healed, right? So I'm still figuring out a lot of this out because it only happened three years and I'm still a kid technically. Even if I'm successful in some ways, I still have a lot to figure out, and I think all of us do. Yeah. But but I think what I would start with is the biggest lesson I've learned is however you feel about your relationship with your father, really any relationship in general, we start from a place of empathy. So acknowledging those feelings. Because my feelings are really bad when I was in my tents. Like I had a fury after him, right? And there's even some things I can't even talk about that would probably get me in jail, like that I had thoughts around him. That I, that I shouldn't even voice. But I think the point is, it's okay to feel those ways, as long as we don't take action on those emotions, because I always had so much anger around him. So I think first is the acknowledgement of the feeling. The second one is an understanding that you aren't the only one who has been through this situation, right? It's the same story that repeats over and over and over and over again. And the only thing that is certain with our life is that li life is limited. We don't have a lot of resources left from a time perspective. So then the third piece to that becomes a decision, a decision to go despite all of the circumstances that I've had in my life. And it doesn't matter what those circumstances, even if I've had bad ones, Josh, I will be empathetic to say I'm definitely one of the luckier ones. I mean, there's some people who have been through horrible things. I was listening to a podcast the other day, some, some guy where his dad killed somebody like that is some other level. So, so I'm very grateful for some of the challenges in my life, which is an odd thing to say. But I think the, the third piece is then we get to make a decision. And the decision is to go, do I figure this out emotionally or do I live the rest of my life as that first person in that story, right, to be that victim? And I just chose that for what life had for me, for the destiny that I got to live later in my 20s when I removed my focus on money and I started focusing a lot more on purpose, which thankfully for me happened earlier in life than later, I got to see 
as Tony Robbins says, if you're going to blame somebody for your failures, you have to also blame them for your success. You have to find the gift because there's always a double-edged sword in every scenario. And and the thought that that really helped me heal most of it, there's still a lot left, but but a good part of it where I can keep playing the game here is is that he was the greatest thing that ever happened in my life. And it was it was the toughest thing for me to admit, but it's true. Yeah. Right. He's he's the one who brought me to French school. He's the one who brought me to Montreal. He's the one who gave me all the opportunities I didn't have. And if I was born in Sri Lanka, I wouldn't be the person I am today. How many languages do you speak? <laughs> I speak three, but I can karaoke in eight. You can karaoke in eight? Yeah, I can. Yeah. What is the weirdest karaoke language song you can sing? That people would be surprised? Probably Korean. There's a great, I'm a huge Korean music fan. So there's a, there's a band called Akadong Musician that nobody on this podcast would know. It's like a, a sibling, they're like a sibling group. And there's a song called Melted that I can pretty much sing like 80% proficiency in Korean. Do you sound Korean when you sing it? I do. So the, how it works in, how, and by the way, I don't speak this language. I want to make sure that's clear. <laughs> so how it works is there's a, there's like a romanticization version of, 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 of any language. In, in Korean, it's called Hangul, where you look at the English words, but it's pronounced in Korean. So you just read it off like it's English and you listen to the track and you're able to pronounce the words carefully. Do you mind giving us a line? <laughs> Uh, what is one of the lines? I usually only do it with the track, but I think it's uh, uh, That's one of the lines, yeah. What does that mean? I have no idea. <laughs> he said something Zero like... Zero idea. <laughs> I'm going to shave my head and ride a unicorn, you maybe said. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Why, why did that become a, a skill set that you developed? Like, is that a, uh, a fun event that you do, karaoke, and go out with friends and do? You got it. So it started as a joke and later became content for what I do today. But what I, when I started, what happened, and, and, and it's not to be racist or anything. I just find our culture is a little bit too sensitive. Most of my friends were Asian when I was in college. Nothing wrong with that. And they just like karaoke. So I, I was a huge gamer. I used to play video games all the time. I've, I've quit cold turkey like f since five years now. But at the time, I was... I was like a semi-professional gamer. So every time we would we would play video games, at the end, a lot of people would go to karaoke. And I was like, where are you guys going? And they're like, oh, we're just going to go sing songs. So they're like, you want to come? I was like, no. But then after the fifth time they asked me, I said, you know what? I might as well push myself out of my comfort zone here. But what I didn't expect is that half of the songs they were singing were not in English. Like one of them, one of my Chinese friends starts singing in Mandarin, the next one in Korean. Part of it was like, I think I could do this. Not sing well, but I still don't sing well for the record. But I would just go home and just practice some of these songs. And then after a couple of months of doing this, I mean, we were just all singing Korean fluently. And it was, it was quite fun, yeah. I want to go to karaoke with you and your friends one day and, and, and experience that. That sounds like a hoot, man. Sounds yeah, like a lot wild. of fun. All right. So, so back to your kind of your story of, of seeking success. Um, you said you went down the route of CPA and such. What did success look like? for you for sure so i would say early in the game josh from 12 to 22 and once again super empathetic if other people feel this way it was all about money it was the only focus of my life because i didn't have any of it mm -hmm. to the point where i wanted to pick a specific career that would guarantee me the highest possible salary so when i chose accounting it the way that I thought about it, and I think it's a good frame, by the way, for your audience to think about how they should live their life, not the money part, but the, the decision making part is out of the 30 person classroom that you're in a group of 100 people, what's one thing that you can do that you feel you can do better than at least 80 per percent of the people in the room doesn't have to be 100 percent but just most people i'll give an example like being a plumber i think is such a smart career choice just not for me because i'm not good with my hands i just it, it would be terrible but to somebody who's let's say really good at manual work i mean being a plumber is so good because most people don't want to be a plumber and it pays a lot of money that's just an example of what i mean yeah. so that's why i stood on accounting because because i'm good with the brain and it was really easy for me to make that decision when i was in sixth grade even if I had no idea what an accountant was, because I was good at mathematics and I was bad at everything else in my report card. So from the ages of 12 to 19, I just studied really hard. So I got the best grades in school. And then when I got to college, I had an oversized suit that I wore from prom because we couldn't afford anything better from Sears. It's like a bankrupt company now. And at that point of the story, Josh, I still didn't know what an accountant did. It's like 19. 
And then after that, I found out about the big four accounting firms, Price Waterhouse, Coopers, et cetera. I thought Price was like a water bottling company because I didn't have any network. And that's how I later became an accountant. That's where the decision came from. But the, the theme was money was the focus until I started making it. So one day you started making money. This came from, you know, poor upbringings. You finally made money. What, at any point did you kind of like the pendulum swings, right? So like you're broke growing up, you now you started making money. And as a CPA or an accountant in, uh, in Canada, you know, money could be good. Like what, what did that look like for you? And did it ever, did you ever fall off rail a little bit? Right. So the pendulum swung really quickly for me, Josh, because for us, a lot of money wasn't like I wasn't making half a million dollars a year before I realized, oh, my God, what am I doing with my life? It was really when I was making 70, 75 grand, which was insane, like an yeah. insane thought right at the time when when i started so what happened was long story short here to, to let's leave out the boring details here so i become an accountant my life completely changes while everyone else complaining about their job i landed a job at price waterhouse cooper so i was like 20. everyone else was complaining about their audience and the fine i was going to work every day because i was like oh my god i'm making 20 dollars an hour this is insanity i'm making more money than my parents combined like it was crazy and then I switched into technology consulting. I got a great gig at IBM. And the starting salary was like 75, 80K. But to your point, when does that pendulum swing? So for me, it was really when I started working at IBM. This was very recently, not like 10 years ago. We're talking 2019. This is four years ago from today's recording. And the pendulum looks something like this, Josh. Let me start with this point. I am super empathetic to somebody who wants to focus just on money. You know, a lot of people say money isn't the solution to all the. Uh, I kind of disagree with that. I think money solves most problems in life if you know how to manage and allocate it correctly. But there will come a time in your life, and for me it was 75K, for other people it'll be half a mil, for other people it'll be 50K, where you realize that the most important resource you have in your life is not money. It's time. And I think it hit me like a ton of bricks when I got and I started working at the company. I loved working at those companies. A lot of people hate their jobs. I loved it. But I realized, hey, wait a second. Do I want to spend the next 10 years of my life working here, then becoming a partner, then doing what? And then it became a dark hole. Then I was like, well, then I don't know what to do. And I started losing purpose. And then that's, that was the dark piece of my life, which thankfully didn't last too long, where I really had to figure out, what do I want to do with the rest of my life, Josh? And a lot of people call that the midlife crisis. I, I, I learned a lot about personal growth. I listened to Lewis House's podcast, School of Grace. I'm a massive fan of his show. And I started listening to his show when I was 20. So I started learning about these things early. And I said, wait a second, I better figure out what I want to do with my time because money is no longer an issue. Whenever my mom told me groceries were expensive, they weren't actually that expensive. $100 isn't actually that much. So when I started paying off all of her family debt and money was no longer a piece of the puzzle, even if I still love it and, and I'm interested in making it, it became what I want to do with my time. And I didn't have a good answer to that question until, of course, what I do today came on my lap. So you're asking this question, you, you kind of hit this, you, your needs are met, right? So now you're not thinking like, oh my God, I got to pay my bills. And you know, the, the people are knocking on my door and I have eviction notices or, you know, handing over keys to a car or whatever the case may be, right? Like I've had those kind of experiences. So once you have your basic needs met and you start to have extra, extra to pay off debt, extra to maybe go on a trip, extra, the extra doesn't essentially bring extra happiness. Right. Once your basic needs are met and maybe you have a little bit more than that, the extra, it's a law of diminishing marginal return. As an accountant, you probably heard that in, in the past. So you said you got to that point and you had extra and then you go, there's something off here. Like my, my time is now more valuable and you had the ability to breathe and think for a minute. And you said, what do I actually want to do with my life? You said you went through a dark spot that was brief. However, it was still dark. What did the darkness look like for you? The, the dark, darkness looked like exactly what Tony Robbins says, which is success without fulfillment is the ultimate failure. So I just got to a point and I was, and I worked so hard to get that job. Like if you had told me at 19, Josh, 
that not only was I going to get a job at one of these companies, which I already thought was insane, because I didn't know anyone there. And I had no business network. I I literally had to email, cold hustle all of these executives. When I was a 19-year-old kid. It's like, hey, I'd like to get a coffee with you. All these executives go, who's this 19-year-old kid? So that's why they wanted to meet me. And that's how I got the job, because nobody else had, the, I guess, the ball, since you said it's uncensored, right? Mm -hmm. The balls to just go like, hey, I'm just going to message these people. And then when I started kind of making money, I think the challenge that I found in my life is I'm introspective in the way that I'm always willing to re-question my decision. So once again, if you had told me at 19, not only was I going to get the job, but then quit the job to start Master Talk, I would have looked at you and been like, what are you talking about? That makes absolutely, like, you, there's something wrong with you. Like, why would I give up a six-figure paycheck to then go start a business? Which I, which I never wanted to do, actually. All of this was co a complete accident. So in that dark spot, a gap, it, it, was, it, was, it, may, it might not have been like a dark spot. I think it's more like I can see myself falling off the ledge. And I'm like walking slowly towards. I think that's the better analogy. So and not in a suicidal way, but more just in a, in a purposeful way. So I think for me, it went back down to I started questioning everything. Like, what's the point of life? What's the meaning? And I did a habit that I recommend everyone there in your audience to do that changed my life, which is to har ask a very difficult question about your life every single day. Because if you do that for 30 days, you will never be the same human being ever again. You can never go back to who you used to be. I call them 80-20 questions. So we all know the 80-20 principle, right, Josh? Like, what are 20% of the the, of the actions that drive 80% of the results. So my version of the Pareto principle is what are 20% of the questions that we can ask ourselves that force 80% of the clarity in our life? So I'm still figuring out these questions and I'm kind of making a list. And I'll write this in my autobiography by like 40 years or something, but I'll give you a couple of them off, off the top of my head. So one is if you had all the money in the world, how would you spend your time for the rest of your life? Not the money, but your time. So let's say I made everybody an instant billionaire. What would you do with your time? And a lot of people don't have a good answer to this question, Josh. They usually reply with, I don't know, man, like travel. And I always answer back, well, what are you going to do? Travel for seven years and then die? And then they go, oh, they're stuck. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have a good answer either. So I answered that one. Another one is if you could only accomplish three things in your life and only three, nothing else, what would you accomplish and why? This is called the focus question. For, forces you to actually figure out what is most meaningful to you. And I guarantee buying an iPhone is not one of those three things. So that would be question number two. And then question number three is simply going, what are you pretending not to know? What are you pretending not to know? I got this from an emotional intelligence training I took a few, oh, a few months ago, and I thought, uh, sorry, a few years ago, that I thought was absolutely great. And actually, I'll give you a fourth one that I got from Devon Bandison that I think is brilliant. And the question is, what's a dream or a goal that you secretly gave up on in your life and never told anyone about? Hmm. So, anyways, long story short, Josh, I asked hundreds of these questions whenever I listen to a podcast. Back when I, I didn't know I could guest on podcasts and I didn't have a business, I didn't have an idea, I would always like ask myself, what if they asked me that question? How would I answer it? And I did that so many times in my life that I was able to find my purpose ultimately. So I screwed up and I didn't hit record. So you might have to, no, I'm just kidding. Wouldn't that suck? Like that was like a great answer, man. I was writing down your questions. I was like, how terrible would it be if I screwed up and didn't hit record? Um, you know, it's I funny. I would have been able to redid all that with a smile on my face because it happened so many times. You wouldn't believe. <laughs> yeah. No, we, we captured that. Um, wow. So out of those four questions that you provided, so those are really, really good questions to ask. Um, which one do you and I want to dig into? I mean, I'm happy to go through all four with you if you want. Okay. But let's... we, but if if you, yeah, go ahead. Pick yeah, pick pick one. Yeah, yeah. I'll let you pick. What's your favorite one? What are you pretending not to know? So, what is the what is the background of that question? Like, why is that question important? Yeah. And then so let's I actually explain it I, to I, us. 
Yeah, so I accidentally said that question. It's not it's not a hundred percent an eighty twenty question because it's hard to interpret. So I would start the other three, but I'll give you my answer to that one. Yeah. So what's interesting about what are you pretending not to know, Josh, is you could you can answer that question a million different ways. So it could be something really small, like uh, you know, what am I pretending not to know that you know I should really work out this week. Oh, I didn't work out last week. I should. Why did I eat the cupcake yesterday? I'm pretending to forget that I ate that cupcake. So it could be really simple. But for me, it has a very deep meaning. And I'll tell you the story behind this. I went to this emotional intelligence training. I've never shared this on podcast to, to ask a girl out. That's why I went to the workshop, not to work on myself, not to be a philanthropist and all this. So I went to this workshop and I'm sitting next to her. And that's where I saw the question. I looked up and it was a big banner. And that's where the question read. And my immediate thought when I saw that question was actually really deep, which was the thing that I'm pretending not to know that I later admitted in my life is that my father's the greatest gift I could ever ask for. And I'm always pretending not to know that. No, my, my father didn't give me shit. I earned everything myself. It was all me. And the truth is it has very little to do with me. It has everything to do with the opportunities that my ancestors gave me. And that was something that I had a lot of difficulty pretending Actually, I had a lot of ease pretending not to know that. So, so that's my version of the question. And today I don't really have a good answer anymore because that's kind of what I've admitted now. Now, now it's probably something along the lines of that, that I don't need a romantic relationship. That uh, that business is the is that my focus, and I don't need to think about dating. That's probably the, my next kind of thing to work on. But I think the 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 idea of that question is the results are only driven for that specific one that you pulled out there on how far you're willing to play. It's like when you asked me before this show, right? Hey, like, can you can like what is there anything that you're uncomfortable with? I was like, sure, life is uncomfortable, but ask me anything. And the reason I'm so open about that, Josh, is because if we don't explore the depthness of who we are, we can never find the truth. And this is one of my kind of my lines that people don't do and why nobody finds their purpose, frankly. This is a little hard, tough love from Brendan, is we do not make our purpose our priority. We don't make it our priority. Right, we don't live in our mother's basement. We don't let know how to leverage our capital. We don't do the extra Uber driving for five hours to make a little extra money to give ourselves that breathing room. But when, or we don't ask the hard questions, right? So when we don't do that, we never find the truth that is unique to us. Hmm. Tough love with Brendan. That that could be a show. You should do a show. I don't know if you do or not. <laughs> Just be yelling at people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think. I think uh, I think that the, these questions are helpful, and uh, you know we really didn't even. And what I love about our conversation so far is we haven't really got into what you or I do. We're spending a lot of time talking about like our thoughts, our belief systems, um, how we respond to adversity, how we have overcome, how we have chased things, how what are we doing internal. And I find that those conversations to me are far more important than going. How do you at you know how do you use an abacus? Nobody gives a shit, right? What is um, that? <laughs> so making our purpose our priority. Is this one of your frustrations when you look out? Because you say one of your things are expanding people's you know, possibilities and kind of unlocking potential in people. When you see people who are not making their purpose a priority, how does that frustrate you or what does that do inside your brain and heart? Right. So if you had asked the same question to me five years ago, definitely your answer is spot on, Josh. Frustration. Oh, my God, why are they doing this? Whereas now it's a, it's a little bit different. You know, for, for me, I think it's important. And I'm still trying my best. I'm still not there yet, for sure. And I'm just learning from people who are wiser than me, like yourself, Josh. People are older than me. But I think the big piece is we need to love people where they are in their journey, right? That's a big part I think the reason I just figured a lot of this stuff, because I'm sure part of you is thinking in the back of your mind, let's put it out there. This kid's 26. Like, how does he, how does he know all this stuff? And I think for me, the, the insight is live your life, like Viktor Frankl says, live your life as if you've already died and you've gotten a second chance at life. So for me, I think a big reason for my success, quote unquote, so I like bringing the quotation marks there, is I use the people older than me and I assume that whenever they tell me something, it's with good intent. 
So when we start from that place, what happens for us is then we go, okay, they're trying to tell me the mistakes that they made, so I don't have to make them. I call this speaking, skipping the line. So, so I'll give you an example. I, I imagine in my mind um, uh, getting divorced from my wife who doesn't exist and losing half of my money and losing custody of my kids because somebody else who was a mentor of mine 20 years older than me, what they went through that pain. So I go through the different – I think of it like whenever I listen to a cassette tape a podcast, it's like listening to the cassette tape of somebody's life. And when you listen to thousands of them, like I have, you get small snippets from everybody's life and you kind of mesh it all together. So to your point, when you asked me, hey, like, do you feel frustrated when somebody doesn't follow their purpose yet? I think for me, it falls into three categories. This is how I define success. So the first category is make a decision to find the gift. Make a decision. So it's not even finding it. It's just making a conscious choice in one's mind to say, one day I'm going to find it. And for everybody, that's different. For some people, it's saying, no, Brendan, I'm a single mother with seven kids. It's going to take 30 years before I get there. For other people, it says, you know, I'm a young buck. I might as well listen to Brendan. He doesn't sound that stupid to me. Let's just do this tomorrow. So they're going to start right away. So wherever they are in the journey, we love them for it anyways. The second part is once you find the gift, whether it takes five months, whether it takes five years. For me, it took uh, four years, right, to find my gift. For Sarah Blakely, it was nine years, right, the founder of Spanx. When you find it, you go all in on that gift and you you use it in the service of others. But there's a third per- percent, there's a third piece of success that a lot of people don't talk about, Josh, which is, and I think it's the most important one, is once you find your gift, create space for other people to find theirs. So it's easy for me to say, I got master talk. I know exactly what my gift is. I know what my purpose is. I know what I'm trying to do in life. But that's only going to serve a small percentage of people who go, wow, Brendan's so cool. That's so awesome. I can learn speaking tips from him, which is hilarious that we haven't even talked about one of them today, which I love. But the other piece, because this is more important based on the intention of your show, but then the other piece is going, Forget about me. Like, how do I create the resources and the tools to help unlock your purpose, to help you go, Brendan, I want to be a baker, but I'm on Wall Street. I was like, well, why are you on Wall Street? Go sell cupcakes to people and do that instead. So I know long-winded answer, but yeah, hopefully that's her. (laughs) A really important question here. Did you ask out the girl? You went to a conference to like- I did. And she said said no and it broke my heart. And I went to a different country for her. My God, it was nuts. Oh my gosh, she said no. All right, how did you ask? So, uh, so I put you on the spot here, didn't I? <laughs> yeah, so so it's it's a little bit depressing. I mean, I'm not going to name names here to make sure she never gets recognized, but the the idea was it, it was a really tough situation, Josh. Basically what happened, and I'm going to sound like such a bad person on this podcast, but I got to share cuz you asked, and I can't say no to a question like I said, is uh is when so I found out my dad was going to die in five days and my flight to go ask out this girl was that night. So I made a decision to go because I I literally thought I was gonna marry this girl. I was like, if I miss out on her, I'm gonna miss out on life. And literally my entire family was okay with it. They said, go for it, which is like weird. Nobody would say that in American culture, but I guess in Indian Sri Lankan culture, they just let me go. So what happened, and I won't expand too much on this, is we got in a car and I received a text on my phone. I can't believe I'm sharing this. I got a text on my phone <laughs> from my sister and the, the text read, dad's dying, come back home. And I was like, cause I thought I had five days, Yeah. but it actually ended up being one. And then, but she was right next to me and she's going, hey, what's wrong? And I was like, I need to go. And she's like, what do you mean you need to go? Like we're having so much fun at this event. She was like picking me up to, to go. It was like 1030 on a Friday night. And it was like day one of the workshop or something. And I was like, I need to go. And then she looked at me and she's like, why are you going? She started freaking out. I was like, where, where do you need to go back home? And I looked at her and I was like, my dad's going to die tomorrow. And then I asked her out. And then she said no. And it was the worst day of my life. That is terrible. Yeah, it was actually really terrible. I know we're laughing about it, but yeah, it was pretty horrible. Well, for me like laughter is a emotional release uh and sometimes it comes from awkwardness it comes from not knowing how to respond uh sometimes it comes from like a a defense mechanism i used to be a a firefighter medic and the way we would deal with traumatic traumatic shit is sometimes we would nervously laugh and it wasn't sometimes the best response but 
like I, di- I didn't know how to deal with these, some emotions. So I say that is that sounds like a terrible, a terrible day. So now you get on a flight. Now you're heading back home. One dealing with dad Two is the girl of your dreams just said no. Yeah. So have you yeah. spoken with her since then? I have. Yeah. I saw her again after three years, a few months ago, and she's engaged now, right? Which I'm super happy for. Yeah. But I think, I think the key was definitely in that moment of my life, I felt like everything was falling apart. Sure. And, and that's why I'm super grateful for my support system, right? I, I'm so lucky and, and I've got unlucky in some ways, but I've gotten very lucky in others where I had the right support system, the people around me to really lift me back up. And and yeah, that's why that's why the whole romantic relationship part has always been a struggle for me, and it's something yeah. I'm still working through. But we'll figure it out. I'm still young. Yeah, I, I I love that you're sharing this stuff. So one of my superpowers, just to let you know, is getting people to say stuff they've never said before, and they're like, Yeah, you have what? it for sure, for sure. <laughs> and, and and I love that, and that and that's that's part of the show here. But like un, unfolding people's stories and 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 then piecing together the advice and the wisdom from people's stories, both good and bad and tough and and easy parts of their life, you know, is, is I think the, the value of this show, um, as you as you look back and you read Victor Frankl's book, you know, uh, man search for meaning, or at least you, at least yeah. you, 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 you know, one of the quotes from it. Yeah, I read um, seven pages and then I got bored. So I'm not that great of a reader, but I love all those quotes. Though. <laughs> yeah. So great, great story. But you, you, you mentioned like the, the man's search for meaning and, and in this finding a life worth living or dying for, right? Um, let me ask this question. I'm going to scrap that question. What was the, what was your response to the toughest part of your life? What did that lead you to do next? So you went and saw dad, you, you were there for your family, you're there for mom and sister, and then you did something else after that. What was your, your next big decision you made in your life? Yeah, I mean, it's it's not super exciting, but it was, and I don't want to make this about what I do, but it was really about going all in on the business, right? I, I realized in that moment that relationships is, is the difficult, and I still believe that, by the way, and that belief can change over time. But if we look at those three buckets, right, health, money, slash purpose, slash business, you know, you could you could break that down, but let's keep it simple, health, money, relationships. I think the question that we can all ask ourselves is in what order should we be achieving those buckets? And I think those pros and cons in, in human beings live differently. But I think the easiest order that is the most optimal way is health, money, then relationships. Because if we live healthier, which actually isn't that hard to do, even if some a lot of us struggle with it, it's a lot of the basic things, right? Don't don't drink soft drinks, don't smoke, don't do drugs, don't, don't do a lot of things, skip a meal, do intermittent fasting. But there's a lot of easy rules, though a lot of people overcomplicate health. That's the first piece. Because if you don't have health, you don't have anything, which was also tough for me to be in my early 20s. Then the next piece I think is really money. Like figuring out a vehicle and how you can find financial success. And ideally, if you can align that with your purpose, and I'm definitely not someone to prescribe how I lived my life to other people. Because it just so happened, Josh, that my my raison d'etre, my, my, my purpose, my light, is also something I can monetize really effectively. And that's not also true with other people. So it's all about balancing those ideas. But the main idea is how do we figure out a financial way to sustain ourselves in our life? But what happens is when those two buckets are met, our value as a human being, and I, and I don't mean that in a negative way, because all of our souls are valued in the exact same way. We're all equals in that way. But then we lift our, each other up, and then we're able to attract the right mate and the right partner to, to, to complete that set. So I think for me, to go back to your question, what did I do immediately? I just focused on business. That was the, the focus. And in the next two years, I'll keep focusing on business, and then I'll go all in on dating. That's the... <laughs> <laughs> so how from, from accounting to public speaking, those seem like total opposite parts of the brain, right? When I think of an accountant, guys, close your eyes right now, unless you're driving or running. And I say the word CPA or an accountant or something like that. And then you you say public speaker, totally different pictures that you have in your mind. So how did you choose that? And I think the the main piece is how did communication choose me? So I never wanted to 
to do this. I never wanted to be a business owner. I was allergic to business because there, there was no successful entrepreneurs in my family. And especially in my community, it's get a job, high paying job and be successful, which is actually the path I wanted. And so my parents never pushed me because a lot of families in our community, they, they, they push their children to do that. But I was perfectly aligned. I was like, yeah, I want to be an accountant. This, this is what I want to do. So I get to business school, Josh, and I'm 19 years old, going back to the oversized suit. So somebody tells me I need to go network. She like meet people, and I was like, okay. So I'm going out to these uh, accounting societies where kids who are three years older than me have internships as the accounting firms. So it still has nothing to do with what I do today. And they were really nice to me, which which I always be grateful for. And then I went to those events, completely clueless. And I would ask Lillian or Josh or Julie, how did you get this job? Which was my dream job that only paid like fifty thousand dollars a year, by the way. And they all said, most of them said, two words, Josh. And the two words were case competitions. And like everybody listened to this podcast, I was just as clueless. What's a case competition? I've never heard of that. And they went on to explain, Josh, that case competitions are like professional sports, but for nerds. So while other guys my age are playing football or basketball, these are presentation competitions and the reasons they exist in business school is a lot of big companies like amazon ibm pwc deloitte they sponsor these competitions with money they bring their executives and they go see who's presenting really well who's sharp and they recruit them into their companies so i saw that as my double golden ticket out of poverty so my golden ticket was coming to canada but my golden ticket for income was those case competitions so i did it just to get a job I was like, if I master these competitions, I will definitely get a job offer at one of these companies. So I tried out for the program. I joined it, which happened to be the world's largest program. And to make a long story short, I became the Michael Jordan that nobody gave a shit about. What does that mean? So when Michael Jordan was a part of The Last Dance, the documentary, the basketball player, right? We all see his craziness of his teams, and we all know him for that. I was very similar characteristically to him, but in a sport that nobody cares about, which was these niche presentation competitions. So when I started winning them, I, it wasn't about the job anymore. I just became insanely competitive about winning them in general. And then I became an executive in that student-run program, and I just took it upon myself to coach everyone else on how to speak because I wanted them to win. That's how the journey started. And then I accidentally became the youngest communication coach. Hmm. Super cool. Yeah. So as you're going through, I'm looking at some of your, you know, some, some of your things, like ton of people on, on LinkedIn are recommending you a ton. Sure. You've got a, a YouTube channel that is, is doing incredibly well. You're one of their content creators and you, for, for master talk and you're helping people with public speaking and communication tips. So you're, you're now in the limelight, right? Like now you're a, you're an influencer on <laughs> these social media platforms. You are, I mean, <laughs> you're doing well. How has that affected your brain when it comes to, you know, putting out content and then getting the likes, the, the, the comments and such, but then also maybe even getting some of the negative uh, pushback from being a content creator. Like, what does that look like for you? For sure, Josh. And I had a lot of the negative side as well, just to close the loop on the story. And then let's jump into your question. So I get to my last semester of college. I landed my dream job. I'm still not a business owner. I still haven't started Master Talk. And then the, one of the 60 people I'd coached for free for three years just asked me the most important question of my life, which was, how did you learn how to speak? And I looked at it and I said, what do you mean, dude? He was like, well, how did you learn? Like, did you hire a coach? Did you do Toastmasters? And I was self-taught because I couldn't afford anything. And that's what sparked the idea for Master Talk because I was watching a lot of the YouTube videos. It still wasn't a coaching practice. And then I realized nobody was sharing the information for free. So I just started making videos in my mom's basement, which I'm still coming to you live from, by the way. I just live with her to retire her. That's why. So I literally started making videos on that couch over there. And I never thought it was going to amount to anything. And to your point, I had a lot of insecurity around the channel because I was only 22 and I started making videos, right? I wasn't yeah. like a, a PhD in communication. I graduated in accounting, by the way. So I wasn't like a, like a pro. I just coached a lot of people and I was disagreeing with a lot of the other tips that people were sharing. It didn't make sense to me. So I was making these videos and I got a lot of hate at the beginning, not from the students, but from university professors. Because one of the thought I had was, hey, if I just share these videos, because nobody's, nobody's watching videos on communication, 
I was like, this is really going to help your students. And I got spat in the face so many times. So why did I keep going? I think for me, what it came down to, man, was realizing the mission. Like for me, the reason I started Master Talk was for the seven-year-old girl who can't afford a communication coach. So for example, like when I do some pro bono work every year, not a lot anymore. Like this is mostly the pro bono work now, just guessing on podcasts and stuff. But the the piece is I would talk to a lot of 15-year-old girls that would be coaching on speaking, and they would always be nervous about communication. And my thought was always, who's taking care of these people, Josh? Because the other people in my industry aren't taking care of these people because they're making a lot of money off executives and stuff. So I just said, like, what if I could be that person? And that why drove me at a level, so I used kind of the anger that I had in my early 10s. Now I shifted that from my father to the other people in my industry who weren't serving the people who couldn't afford a coach. So that became a big why. So I think Gary V says it so well. You need to mature yourself as a content creator where you get to a point where the negative and the positive is all the same noise, which is when people praise you, then people go, then you have to go, hey, thank you, I really appreciate it. But when people hate on you, you have to also go like, that's the place that they're in their life. So I think the main idea is we need to mature ourselves before we have the responsibility of maturing other people's lines of thought, their possibilities, the way that they live their life. And and for me, I think the the silver lining is I was able to mature myself emotionally to deal with a lot of that hate when it started coming my way. Hmm. Interesting. What bad advice is are people coaches or you know YouTube videos giving about communication or public speaking? Like, are, do you see something and you're like, that's terrible advice, and here's why? For sure, Josh. Yeah. So, so I used to be a lot more aggressive about this. Obviously, being the immature kid that I was, I'm still a little bit immature today. But I, I think for for now, a lot of those people that I, that I shat on are now my colleagues. They're really good people, right? They're, you know, the guy who has a PhD. It turns out, like, oh, he's a really good dude. He's just looking at communication from a different lens. So that's the lens that we can explore, which is the big thing. Can I implement what you're saying? That's the idea. So for example, let, let's go back to early in this conversation, right? The reason I'm, I'm speaking, because I'm sure you're thinking this too, like whatever Brendan's sharing is always practical. Okay, like tomorrow I can ask myself these 80, 20 questions. This is not like some foo-foo stuff. It's like, okay, like if you ask the question, you'll get clarity. And if you don't, you'll be stuck. So it's like, okay, step one, step two, step three. But that framework, I feel doesn't exist in life as much. I'm trying to create that as well. But it definitely didn't exist in communication. Example. Uh, picture everyone in the underwear. What if everyone's attractive? Then what do you do? Do you keep staring at them? Like, that doesn't work. So notice how I just broke that. Or the second myth, uh, the fear is the number one thing in the world and it's everything's closer to death. I was like, doesn't matter if that's true. If we focus on that, we'll never get better. So what's the point of even talking about that? Or even starting a conversation. And then the third piece is practicality. Speak clearly. What does that mean? Like, how do I action? Like, do, do I just speak clearly? Like, how do I get a place in my life where I'm speaking clearly? So there's just a lot of unanswered questions, Josh. So I think what I brought to the industry was more of a structure, which I define, not to get too much into the weeds here, but communication is like juggling 18 balls at the same time, right? So one of them is eye contact. One of them is smiling. One of them is eyebrows. One of them is having the right haircut. One of them is storytelling. So it's just about tackling it in the right order. Because if you're juggling the balls that are easiest, like the questions or the random word exercise, sending video messages to your family becomes easier. And that's what I feel I brought to the table. So it wasn't the fact that I was smarter. I just felt that I was sharing things that nobody else was talking about. So I felt I had legs. So who would be a good fit out of these guys in the, in the audience, the uncensored advice for men, the, the, the men listening in, you know, to this point, they're going, yeah, you know, this is a guy I'd like to learn more from, like, and uh, I need to improve my communication skills or public speaking or whatever that looks like, like, where's a good place for them to connect with you to follow your work? What's, what's a good starting point? For sure, Josh. So in case you don't ask me uh, another question, I'll give you the, the piece of advice that I also share that I'm happy to share where to, where to yeah. connect. And the advice is be insane or be the same. If you want to be like everyone else, that's totally fine. But if you want to live a life of purpose, you want to do something interesting in your life, the only path forward, I believe, is the path of insanity. Don't you find it odd, Josh? 
that you're talking to a 22 year old kid who's not 22 anymore, but who makes YouTube videos not on pranks or music or comedy like most of the kids do, but on executive communication tips. Then he wanted to coach those executives, build a successful practice yet. He still lives in his mother's basement. He dances in that basement an hour a day alone. He has a car, but he's too scared to drive it. So his sister drives the car for him. He's in the top 1% of all listeners on Spotify for Justin Bieber. And he karaoke's in eight, soon to be nine. I'm trying to learn Telugu right now. Nine languages. How does that make sense at all? And that's the point, my friend. When every decision in your life makes sense to the only person that it should, which is you, you're probably making the right decision. So every time you make a decision in your life, always ask yourself, am I walking the path of sameness or insanity? And it's for me, it's really binary. It's, I feel it's one of the two. And then you just make that conscious decision and you move forward. And then the two way to keep in touch, just to add on, I just wanted to get that out there, is the YouTube challenge is go to Master Talk or go to one of our free trainings for communication at rockstarcommunicator.com. Wow. What you just did was an eight mile approach. Uh, Eminem had had a show on or a movie, Eight Mile, right? And in the thing, you know, they do rap battles. And yeah, yeah. I, I love Eight Mile. <laughs> it's such a, it's a, it's such a, a, a great movie. Um, and in the rap battle, he starts off and he's getting beat up because guys always use the same thing. Yeah, your mom was a crack whore and she's a prostitute and you live in a trailer park. So then the last one, he just goes, I know this. I know this about me. And that's what you just did. I live in mom's basement. I make, you know, I dance alone for an hour a day. I, I have a car, but I can't drive it or I won't drive it. And I, I, I sing karaoke. You just completely like disarm. And I, and I love that. And I think that that is one of the most, uh, most thing I admire about men is when they're willing to go, this is who I am. This is the direction I'm going. I'm a man on mission. I'm a man on purpose. Yeah. These are all the things that you could probably just, dis, you know, discredit me for whatever, or judge me about, but I'm moving forward. Are you on? Are you in? Are you out? And I love that about you, Brandon. And I'm so glad we connected. Um, what question should I have asked you that I screwed up and did not ask you? I think we covered a lot. Is there one thing that I feel is missing? Right. So it's, it wouldn't be a question because you'll probably just ask me to answer the question. I think it would, it would just be the, the insight. I appreciate that, Josh. I would say the last piece that we haven't talked about is finding your passion. And I think that's a crock. Like a lot of people are making the mistake of trying to find a passion in their life. Let me tell you why that is a mistake. The reason is because you could be passionate about anything. You can be passionate about your dogs, your cat, your significant other, uh, doing the laundry, uh, jogging, communication. So because of that, it's a general piece. Obviously, if you're like an Elizabeth Gelbert and you know what that is from the top of your head since you were a kid, like amazing, go, go do that. But I'm a great example, Josh. That's why I think I'm a great case study for, for a lot of people of somebody who didn't really have a purpose, didn't really have a passion. Like, you know, you, you would think when you asked me, where did you find your communication? You would think I would answer, oh yeah, I was always passionate about communication my whole life. It was my calling from the beginning. Yeah, that's that's a load of horseshit, right? It wasn't the case. Like I have a physical disability, I have a crooked left arm. I spoke my whole life in a language I didn't know. I studied in literally the opposite of what a communication professional should be doing. Yet that's where I, I landed. So why did that happen? Because of this, decisions matter significantly more than passions in your life. So the question is not, what are you passionate about? You might be stuck in that question for 20 years and not have a good answer. I think the better question is, what does the world need me most to do right now and why? Or what do I feel is the right next move for me? So when I was 12 years old, the answer to that question was at Master Talk. I thought YouTube, since we're uncensored, I thought it was for rich white kids who had wealthy parents. That's what I thought YouTube was for when I was a kid. So I never imagined me being one. So for me at the time, it was saying, I wanna be an accountant. That's the right next move. I gotta retire my mother. I gotta make sure she doesn't suffer. And I gotta selfishly make myself wealthy so I don't have to suffer. That was the focus. 
So that decision led me to become an accountant and go to business school. So then when I went to business school, I made the next decision. I go, I found out about these things called the big four accounting firms. Like, oh, people work there. Oh, it's like Price Waterhouse Cooper's not a water bottling company. Is that like somewhere I should work? So then I make the next decision, which is to get a job at PwC. So I sign up for case competitions. And then that next decision led me to IBM. And that next decision allowed me to coach people because I had to do the case competitions to get a job. And I became the youngest communication coach and found Master Talk. But here's the punchline. If I never made the decision to be an accountant in the first place, this conversation would not exist in the ether. Right? This whole conversation just wouldn't exist. So what's the punchline? The punchline is realizing two things. One, get used to doing work you don't like. Because even if you're doing something you're passionate about, there's always a 20, 30%, including my life, that isn't perfect. Sales calls, not the biggest fan of. I'd rather just coach people directly. Like There's always things that you're not going to enjoy. So get used to doing work that you don't enjoy, that ideally optimizes for what Gain Hendrick says, your zone of excellence. Find something that you're really good at that you can get paid to do. That's always the first step because that gives you leverage. I call this side hustling comfortably. So for me, that's being an accountant. For somebody else, that was being a plumber. And then when you start making money, delta the difference in your savings account. Don't put it to an iPhone. Don't put it to stupid shit. Make your purpose your priority, even if you don't know what it is. I had, I had a year savings before I left my corporate job, even if I didn't know what the purpose was. And I just kept saving money, but that gave me breathing room to start asking all the deep questions that we talked about today. And then I found Master Talk through that. And I think that's the right order for most people. Super interesting, man. What I would love to do is 10 years from now, I want to have another conversation with you. And then we look back and we go, you know, what, what has changed in our world? Cause you said, this is currently what I believe this is currently where I am. And it may change over time. I would love to have set a reminder in your phone. Hey Siri, set a reminder for 10 years to have another chat with Brendan. It didn't, it didn't work, but anyways, <laughs> I would love to do that. Um, Brendan, thanks so much for coming and showing up for for the men in our audience to give you know your your advice and your story here which uh i so valuable you know I, I found so valuable to to listen in on so i appreciate you man thank you so much this was one of the most powerful conversations i've ever had in my life josh and i would love to have that conversation again in 10 years i love your intention i love the gift that you have and, and thanks for showing me how powerful podcasting can be and reminding me that i'm doing something important with my life you are. You are. Guys, I love you, and I'm so glad uh, we get to have these conversations together. Um, reach out to me, uncensoredadviceformen.com. Uh, There's a quick contact form. Reach out to me. What kind of questions do you have? What kind of struggles do you have? What are some of the things that you're facing that you're unsure about how to move forward? And then what I'll do is I'll bring on guests who talk about those things. I love you guys, and we'll talk to you all on the next episode. Bye, everybody.